understand about the inventor, you have to understand the advances that have been made in submarine technology before him. The first submarine, a lot of people ask, was it Hundley? Is it Alligator? Was it Turtle? No. Actually, it goes back to 1620. A Dutchman named Cornelius van Drabel meets all the criteria for a submarine. He has an ability to move on the X, Y, and Z axes, he stays underwater for a while, and he has something mysterious called a chemical liquor to refresh the air. This will come back again and again and be referred to as the bucket and bellows approach. It may be something as simple as tossing water into a bucket of dried lime, which activates or slakes it and attracts the CO2 molecule. It doesn't split it like a modern air scrubber does, but it releases all the other gases you can breathe. This goes much further back than we thought it would be. Supposedly King James II took a dive in this too. That we can't prove. By the time of the 18th century, submarines are pretty, pretty calm, but every five or six years, someone has a functioning submarine. A lot of them are French at the beginning because they're involved in wars with England. Uh, there's also a theory that they wanted to get Napoleon out of exile, stuff like that. I think after a while, they were just bitten by the bug and liked the idea. Uh, the Germans have a couple, the U.S. has a couple, and Villawa makes a salvage boat uh, in 1859, right before the beginning of the war. During the rebellion, there's good hard evidence for almost 30 submarines and oblique references here and there to a great many more. We don't talk about them too much up in the north because we won, and they're considered illegal. At the very worst, or very best, they're considered bad form. This is a period, uh, the Victorian age, if I'm going to attack you, it's only gentlemanly to say on guard. If I'm not going to do that, like a sniper, snipers are considered murderers. Well, a submarine is an underwater sniper. I can take out your ship of several hundred men without giving you any warning whatsoever. However, wartime sees both sides making submarines hammers and tongs. Now, I would love to tell you this is Brutus Villawa. I would love to tell you any of these guys are Brutus Villawa. The truth is, despite almost 20 years of searching, we don't know of any picture of Brutus Villawa, nor do we know who any of these guys are. So take your pick, and that's Brutus if you want. <laughs> we know a fair amount about his life. He's uh, born in 1794, which is actually a fortunate time to be born, even though his country's involved in old Napoleonic Wars, because they will end just as he comes of draftable age in France. So he never serves in the French military. His father's a printer, and while we expect him to follow in that, that vein, he's sort of a Renaissance man all over the map. Uh, we'll go through these pretty quickly here, but he has inventions that will span 20, 30 years, and address a wide variety of fields. Important thing for us is in 1832, he designs, builds, and demonstrates his first submarine. He may have cut his teeth with a fellow named Castera, who actually never built a sub, but was recognized as the biggest French advocate of submarines under Napoleon. He calls it a fish boat, or a bateau poisson. It's got a few unique features. Uh, because propellers are just now starting to catch on, and it's really not sure they're gonna really stay the course, He's got folding propellers. Now, propeller just means something that pushes something else. The valves in your heart in a medical book of the period are called propellers because they push the blood around. Uh, you would call ski poles propellers. So this confused us for a while because there's obviously no prop on there, but even the folding oars are called propellers. He's got watertight gauntlets in there because the idea is you look through a glass hole in the bottom of the boat, look at your salvage, reach out with watertight gauntlets or opera gloves, and tie a rope around the salvage, go back to the surface. They're reasonably watertight. Most interestingly, he has what looks like a double hull ballast tank here. This is a small little boat. There's really no room for ballast tanks, but the double hull thing intrigues us. He goes on to do a whole variety of things. Uh, there he makes his one contribution to the world of printing. He has frictionless pump. He's a civil engineer flotation devices, he works for the French government at one point in time. He is seconded then to the Royal Sugar Refinery in Greece, which seems an odd assignment, but you have to understand the French and British has just helped the Greeks toss the Turks out. And the price the Greeks are having to pay is that the French and British are coming in and taking over industry and the government. So in effect, he's working for France and all the proceeds are going back to France as well. This might be where he actually made his money. He's not only knighted by the French government for setting up the business, and fails at attempting to introduce photography to Greece, but he discovers asphodel. Previous to this, sugar is made from beetroot, and there's a fair saccharine content in there. With asphodel, it's six times the amount, plus this grows wild on the hills of Greece. So it revolutionizes the industry and puts a lot of money in the pockets of the uh, shareholders back in France, and probably Villawa as well. He is then knighted by the French government. He's now a double knight, and this is when his name legitimately changes to de Villawa. When we began researching, we thought, oh, he must have pulled an Ellis Island thing. 
where instead of V it, I become von Weit when I, you know, my ancestors get off the boat. No, he's legitimately a French knight at this point in time. He has all manner of patents here, an optical rangefinder. This is one he tried to push, and you would think it would catch on at the beginning of the Civil War, but the government wouldn't bite for some reason. And finally, his last patent is for a, a unique wind instrument. Again, all over the map. He's got a head for science and engineering. Uh, the episode in the woods of Pennsylvania from 1849 to 50 proves he has no head for business. He's working for a group called the DeRoy family. He's supposed to set up sawmills and uh, coal mines, but he has no head for business whatsoever. This is a total, total failure. It ends up with lawsuits both in France and the United States, and we are not certain how much money or whose it was Villawa lost. But he runs back to France with his tail between his legs and stays there for a couple of years. In 18, 1856, he moves back to Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia has a large enclave of French expats, so he never has to learn English and never will. Oddly enough, he marries Eulalie de Roux, who's a French spinster. Notice it's the de Roux family again. We don't really know if they bailed him out or they're forgiving him for spending their money. Doubtful it's true love, a reward, a penalty. It's probably more a deal. You take the spinster, we'll forgive you all the money you lost us because I want her married. We have no idea <laughs> how that worked. Happily for historians, she speaks flawless English and more importantly, she has perfect penmanship. Thank goodness, because <laughs> he has neither. In 1857, there's an accident that changes the course of Illawarra's life. The Central America, with $72 million in period money and gold, founders off the coast of the Carolinas. We sort of lose track nowadays just how much gold was transiting the oceans and the Isthmus of Panama from the gold fields in California. Uh, this was not an uncommon amount of money to bring back. They would actually have parades from the docks to the banks in the streets of New York and Philadelphia as they bring literally through wagons of gold. The banks said, we have to loan more money. We have so much gold in the vaults we can't store anymore. This is how much gold there is out there. This ship would not be found uh, until like the past decade or so, way deeper than anybody could have managed at this point in time. But they don't know that. They think it's going down to just a couple hundred feet of water, which is just about at the limit of salvage divers and also submarines. There's a coalition made up a lot of the Deru family and other mostly French lawyers, politicians, gentlemen of means, if you will. They hire Villawa to build them a submarine because he has experience. He's recognized as a civil engineer of the first grade in France. His reputation has preceded him despite the fiasco in the woods of Pennsylvania. They used to build a sub. The salvage boat, which is what we'll call this stage of it, is begun in Philadelphia at Bush Hill Ironworks. And we may have our only portrait of Villawa here, the gentleman towing something in the foreground there, which looks suspiciously like his first submarine. Unfortunately, it's from his back. This is about 1857, 1858. This is our only peek inside the submarine at this time. A reporter's allowed in for about five minutes. Villawa keeps his cards very close to his vest. Uh, for instance, the ballast tanks are not shown here. We know the ballast tanks had pumps to admit water but they were not rigid. They were actually rubber-coated or latex-coated uh, canvas bags. And to push out ballast, the crew was told, lean against this one, now lean against that one. Of course, if they go down too deep and you can't lean hard enough, they all stay down there. So it's, it's primitive. We've got some sort of propulsion here. The men would actually tug on these ropes back and forth, rotate the wheel in the back, which would spin a propeller. We've also got a diver's hatch. We know this worked because he is a bit of a showman. A couple times the sub is demonstrated and the crew would be on top, have it towed to where it was going to be demonstrated, wave to the crowd, get in the boat from the top hatch. The boat would disappear and a few minutes later a couple divers would pop up and wave to the crowd, go back down and be in the boat when it comes up. Now you'll notice this hatch is open to the entire hull of the submarine, which means he has to pressurize the entire hull to keep the water out. This is a very primitive approach to this that will be remedied with the coming war. It's demonstrated twice in 1859. This is sort of a supersized version of it. One thing that's not showing here that we know existed in reality, and Villawa may be the inventor, there are bow planes here. In doing the research for this book, I looked at every picture I could find and read every description I could of submarines before this salvage boat. I think Villawa invents the hydroplane. No sub before has bow planes on it until this boat. Unfortunately, it is never perfected. It never works totally properly. No salvage operation is ever undertaken, and his investors are about $300,000. 
These are different sites along the river where uh, it was built and then demonstrated, and finally he ends up in Delanco uh, across the river in New Jersey. Now, in the federal census, you might wonder why the book is called Natural Genius. I actually hate searching for it online because it's like Chuck Viet, Natural Genius. That's not what I meant at all. He's recorded twice. At Marcus Hook in Pennsylvania, where Villawa is working at the time, he puts down his correct age, he puts down he's a civil engineer, he lists his wife with her age and everything, but he lives in Philadelphia at a boarding house that's run by an Irish woman, Mrs. Foy. And I can just hear her voice whenever the census taker says, what's he do? She's not really sure. Well, sure, he's a natural genius, don't you know? <laughs> Hence the name of the book. And she gives him a few years off his age, too. But uh, Bill Wan never claimed that he was always a civil engineer, so we suspect that's not him answering that question. In 1861, of course, in April, Fort Sumter is fired upon. Villawa decides to donate his boat to his new country to help them win. He is a staunch abolitionist, and this is one way he can make a contribution. On the 17th of May, it is captured in Philadelphia by the suspicious harbor police. It pops up. The two guys who are actually running it to go get pig lead for ballast, neither one speaks English, and they're in an infernal machine, which is our cute sounding word for meaning weapon from hell at the time. That's what they considered subs. It was also perilously near the Navy Yard, so they were arrested. Of course, the next day, the civilians go to the Navy and say, you do know this guy's been demonstrating this boat for like two years now. Maybe you ought to take a look. The Navy does decide to take a look, mostly because the day after, the rebels raise the Merrimack and begin making the Virginia. Now there's an arms race on. There were three solutions to the monster Merrimack, and monster is a term they used at the time in the same way we would, and it's almost always used before the word Merrimack if you read the books. Plan A, of course, is ironclads. We know the monitor was successful, but the Navy wasn't certain that design was going to work. They had Galena and New Ironsides on the ways as well. Neither one of those would be ready in time. Monitor barely was. Plan B, oddly enough, was a ram fleet of iron-hauled ships. This was Secretary of the Army's, or Secretary of War Stanton's idea, and it was crazy. The Navy wanted nothing to do with it. Lincoln, sadly for Secretary Wells, said, it floats, right? Stanton goes, of course. Good, the Navy will take care of this. Oh, the Navy fought this tooth and nail, because this was old, old school. But it would have worked. If you picture Virginia with the low freeboard, the distance from water to top deck, we think nowadays that might actually have been submerged a little. Ram ships would have worked fine. It might have taken out one or two port and starboard with a broadside, but others would have gotten through. And the idea was to have four or five of these stationed around Virginia, which took a half hour to come about. It wasn't a bad plan, really. Plan C? The submarine. Now, the Navy wants the boat, but they want it to be finished and proven. The same backers, <laughs> possibly foolishly, say, okay, we'll, we'll fund the boat, and we'll send you receipts, and you pay us as we need materials, and then pay us when it's all done, and we get a bounty when Merrimack is sunk, right? The Navy agrees. July of 1861, a Commander Hoff is sent across the uh, river to take a look at the boat, uh, along with a couple other officers, and it does meet their criteria. It can dive repeatedly, it can stay down for a while. I question the part about without the least fatigue or exertion to the men, because it's all manual labor. Um, it can do it as often as they want to. It can actually deploy a diver underwater and get him back and support him while he's outside with a tube. There's no mention of pumps, but this is almost a necessity uh, for the diver. It can generate an artificial atmosphere by some chemical process. That's not specified. Their major concern is speed. This thing can only go about one and a half miles per hour. That will barely stem the current in a stream, but they want a bigger, better boat that will go faster. First mission for what they're now calling the Iron Fish, or at least one of the backers is calling it, is to destroy the Virginia at Gosport as she's a boarding. Now she has an official target. This was probably an impossible mission. Even being dropped off as close as was safely possible under Rebel's guns out here, it's a 10-mile journey underwater with bonfires and flares and picket boats watching for you the whole time. Once you attack Gosport Navy Yard and maybe sink Virginia, now they're really watching for you and mad. You got 20 miles to row back again. I don't know if it would have been physically possible to do, but desperate times. On November 7th, construction actually begins at Nephi and Levy in Philadelphia on the brand new boat. The fate of the salvage boat, we know, was just left to settle in the mud. Somewhere across the river in Rancocos Creek near Delanco, New Jersey, is a pre-Civil War submarine that we have proof, uh, written proof that we just let it settle in the water. This is an archaeologist's dream. We've joked for years about hosing it off and looking for the keys under the seat. That would answer so many questions because there's technologies on board there that we have no idea how they made things work. We haven't found it yet. We have a couple sites that we've found magnetometer hits that look like promising sites. 
same size, same mass, same dimensions as the Saba. Unfortunately, there are a lot of hitches. For the entire winter, there are delays with the boat. The Navy wanted this done in 40 days and it ends up being months overdue. The workmen, understandably, have never made a sub before. Villawa is very picky. Uh, he hates being questioned whenever he says, I want this, that, and the other thing. His investors have learned from working with Villawa. They don't just give him a blank check. Every time he wants something, as much as a pipe or a wrench or a, a pump, it's like, what are you going to use it for? Tell me how you're going to use it. Why do you need this model? Why not a cheaper model? And it, it just bugs the devil out of him. One thing to keep in mind, we'll discuss this at the end of the show, the thing that sticks in his craw the most is he wants a certain quantity of silver. Now it is known at this time that if you take very thin little plates of silver and use them as one end of an electrical connection, it will make a spark. All scientists know how to do this children in school know how to do this, and it takes, I think in period money, like $12 worth of silver plates to do this. Villawa wants about $2,000 worth of silver, specifically in 12 inch sheets, an eighth of an inch thick, and he won't say why. Some researchers that work with me said, oh, he's trying to steal from the Navy. There were safeguards in place. He never got his silver. He had to justify it. At one point, his, his contractor, who is the gateway for buying him anything, has the a stupid idea of sending him a quote from a child's high school textbook saying, here's all the silver you need. And Villawa just flips out because you're questioning me and I'm not going to tell you because you can't understand what I'm doing. So keep that thought in mind. I have an idea what he might have been doing. Uh, the sub is months overdue. And what's more, by February, its target is now floating off Gosport Navy Yard. This is an ideal situation for the submarine. The water there's only 30 feet deep. It's just perfect to attack this boat. But the sub is far, far from ready. On the 7th of March, obviously, it goes on what the crew thinks the shakedown crews, but no, they're actually going to combat, and it strikes the next day. And Monitor happily gets there in time. By April, Villawa has had enough. There are ongoing issues about his commission as a Navy officer. This isn't his ego at work here. If he's captured as a civilian, he can be hung as a pirate. So yes, if I'm going to go into combat, by the way, with a crew that speaks all French, our first combat mission would have been all in French, he wants a commission. There's a delay in that. Uh, there's confusion over pay for his crew and everything, not so much how much, but how they get paid, and he doesn't understand what's going on. He's infuriated that the contractor continues to question him, and he's insisting upon pointless protocols. He won't talk to anyone lower than basically the Secretary of the Navy. And it's like, I have a war to run, dude, you know, I'm paraphrasing here. We don't know if he's confused, if he's persecuted, if he's aging. Um, it's hard to say. His men are very loyal to him. Uh, they do say at one point, though, in a, in a letter that survived, that we really would like someone younger and more dynamic. They treat him sort of like their favorite uncle or a grandfather. They don't want to hurt his feelings. This is his baby, the culmination of all his experiments over the years. But God, they want somebody with a little more, you know, gung-ho. Finally, at the beginning of May, the submarine is launched in the river. This is a painting by Jim Chrisley of one of the backers, Hearst, who insisted after all this pain of riding into the water. So it goes into the river on May 1st. And again, I already explained why a propeller. It is rowed by a crew of 18 men down, nine on each side, like a bunch of Vikings. Unlike the fish boat, these oars are a little unique. They're all mechanical now and solid iron, but they will deploy on the power stroke and fold on the return stroke. <coughs> Unfortunately, of course, there's resistance on the return stroke too, so the speed is really not more than three or four knots. But that's why it's called a propeller, because those propel it along. This is a quick schematic of it with a sailor in there for scale. It is claustrophobic as all get out. There are 18 men rowing. Uh, there's one captain, one possibly two divers. We now have an airlock or an air chamber up front here with a bulkhead that can be sealed. So now we only have to pressurize that one chamber in the bow instead of the entire boat. And we know that's what they did because one of the men who years later went after a, an invalid pension for ruptured eardrums says, my eardrums ruptured when the valves around the door broke one day and the pressure just, you know, popped my eardrums. The boat was leaky. Uh, it was, guys were, were laying claim for rheumatism and sore joints and everything, especially because you had to manually load all the lead ballast. It had to be handed down the hatch and passed back like this from man to man because each seat, uh, you would take the top off and put the lead ballast in there. This is how you trim the boat port to starboard. If two of us get on and I ate more over the weekend than the guy next to me, some of the ballast under my seat has to go to him. So it has to get passed down and then passed side to side. Those seats are sitting on the liquid ballast tanks. There are four of those that we know of and we also know how they were filled. It's intricate and it took probably about two weeks with an Excel spreadsheet to figure out how you could do this safely. There is a procedure for loading 
and uh, lead and ballast and crew that will make this a successful boat. It's just incredibly intricate. And only a veteran crew could do it reasonably safely. On the 11th, its target is scuttled. Now we have a submarine with no target involved anymore. It has no mission. So the Navy is, people say, well, the Navy didn't really accept the boat. It's the middle of the Civil War. It, the Navy's never gonna call this USS. There's no christening ceremony. Uh, at this point, it still has a civilian crew, but the Navy wants the submarine. And here's an opportunity. Now, it is still a civilian-owned boat. At the end of the seven days battles, the Navy is tasked with a mission it does not want by President Lincoln. Deploying from Fortress Monroe and being towed all the way up near City Point, right after the end of Malvern Hill, which is the last of the seven days battles, its target is the uh, obstruction of Drury's Bluff. This is the cork in the bottle of the James River. The Navy's tried taking this on before, but been stopped by the obstructions and the guns from the fort on the top of the hill, Drury's Bluff, it just can't be hit by the Navy. The guns, our guns are made to fire at enemy ships, not up over the hills. We can't get past. The alternative is a bridge at Swift Run Creek. This is critical simply because the railroad that supplies Richmond goes through Petersburg and crosses both Appomattox Creek and Swift Run Creek over two bridges. The Navy is told, drop that in the water. It's important enough that Commander John Rogers doesn't like it, but he's given the entire James River Squadron. He has given 11 of the 12 ships plus a submarine. He says, I don't think this is going to work, but when Abe Lincoln says do it, he's going to do it. He has a new commander because uh, Davila has skipped town. This is Sam Eakins. Sam, as a first submarine commander in the Navy, is probably the most qualified person on the planet, considering we have no training for submarine commanders at this point in time. Um, in the Mexican War, he was stationed in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he learned to deal with explosives. He's an ordnance officer. His family business is electroplating. Now he can use sparks with gunpowder, which is a dangerous combination. What's more, he's an expert salvage diver. He worked uh, for John Gowan over in Sevastopol, bringing up the Russian Black Sea Fleet of about 80 ships in the mid-1850s. So this is perfect. He can make things go boom with sparks underwater. It's exactly what we want in a submarine commander. However, he has mere weeks to recruit and train a crew of totally green sailors. He just goes to one of the receiving ships in Philadelphia and takes volunteers. And there's, remember I said how you, you could only make this boat function with a trained crew? Eakins doesn't know even how to train them. It's, it's a ridiculous request for him, but we want the river raid done. It is a complete failure. The sub is deemed too valuable. Rogers takes one look at it and says uh, to Eakins when he gets down there, he goes, uh, how, how tall is the sub from the keel to the, the domed hatch? Six feet. Did the guys in Washington not realize that the little blue line under the bridge is four feet deep? And when they capture it with a net, they'll figure it out and come against my fleet, which is all wood. So it doesn't even get in a combat zone. It just gets hauled back. The squadron uh, from the James River, they get hung up on Appomattox Creek for two solid days. If Lee had sent just one battery of artillery down, it would have changed the course of the war. He's too focused on McClellan at Malvern Hill. He, his only concern is he keeps on asking, are they landing troops? Are they landing troops? They're not. But the ships are bottled up, grounded for two solid days till they finally get out of there. The boat at this time does acquire its nickname, the name we know it by, Alligator. A reporter supposedly sees this green thing coming through the water doing this, and he says, God, it looks like an alligator. Officially, it was always the submarine propeller, if you look in the, the Navy history books, but everyone else calls it Alligator. Finally, in August, they get around to testing the boat after it's been deployed once. Tom Selfridge is a, a logical choice, but he's death on underwater warfare. Um, for one thing, he's he was stationed aboard Cumberland when she was sunk by the Merrimack, and he has even less training in submarines than Eakins does. And he manages to almost drown the crew one day because, again, they don't know how the boat works. And there's a great little terrifying drawing of, of, with stick figures of the boat on its fanny like this off the Washington Navy Yard with like 18 little figures down there like this. According to the story, they climbed their way back up the rowing benches to rebalance the boat, pumped her out, and surfaced, and no one died. Eakins and the entire, I'm sorry, Selfridge and the entire crew requested surface duty and were sent west. His report, though, is incredibly damning. The Navy doesn't want the submarine. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to. It doesn't go fast. They can't figure out how to make the thing work because Villawa is nowhere to be found. The contractors are desperate for some kind of payback, and they agree to make whatever changes the Navy sees fit to, to you know, force on them, and they'll pay for it just because they want, they're under budget right now. They spend about 8000 of the 14000 the Navy has allocated, and they just want to get paid back. The winter refit of 62 to 63 is under Sam Eakins. He's back on the job at this point in time, and speed is the big issue. 
Plus with 18 men in there, you're using up a lot of oxygen you don't need to. They pull out the oars and put in a more standard propeller. This has an axle that runs on the center of the sub. Now nine guys can sit kitty corner from each other, turn the same axle and turn the prop. This halves the amount of CO2 that's being spewed out and halves the amount of oxygen being breathed. So your dive time now goes from about two hours to four plus, which is incredible for a Civil War submarine. One little side note here, at this point in time, there is the distinct possibility that Abe Lincoln scooped Teddy Roosevelt in being the first U.S. president to set foot foot aboard a U.S. sub. In Lincoln's spare time, of which there wasn't much, if you look at his diaries and his itinerary, most times he had free time, he would go down and visit his buddy Dahlgren, Admiral Dahlgren, at the Washington Navy Yard. They would look at new stuff, they would sit and smoke cigars and drink brandy, and they would fish. And Lincoln just loved to see new technology, had to try everything. There is no way he could do more than stick his head down the hatch of alligator. The chances of him touching her are very, very good. Finally, in April of 63, Alligator has a mission that's tailor-made. And I should point out, when we look at subs like Hunley and then subs like Alligator, there are two different kinds of sub there. And I'll use modern technology. Confederate submarines are made as attack submarines. They want to break the blockade by sinking Yankee ships. We don't care that much about Confederate ships. We have a massive surface fleet. What we want to do is tear out the obstructions that are keeping out our surface fleet. So most Union boats, northern boats, come from a long tradition of salvage. Well, this is perfect because what we want to do is get down there and tear out the bases of obstructions and the torpedoes which are suspended from the bottom. There are no number of these blocking the channel in and Admiral DuPont, who is aware of Alligator, he was in charge of the Navy Yard when she first appeared, knows that she's available and he wants to use her. Unfortunately, the one thing that Villawa had always told the Navy and everyone else was, this is meant for rivers and harbors. She's not meant for the open ocean. Don't tow her on the open sea. The Navy tows her on the open sea and they get hit with a storm that it's out of season, but the description is like a hurricane. A couple guys are washed overboard. Eakins is smashed so hard against the railing and the mast, he's missing molars and has nerves damage in his face the rest of his life. Uh, he busts up a couple organs inside. He's pretty much debilitated after this cruise. The sub goes down somewhere in the graveyard of the Atlantic. We're not really sure where, because they were just happy on board the tow ship to still be on the right side of the water. They limped back two days later after repairing the ship to report the loss. We don't know if it floated around, if it went to the bottom. Uh, or what shape it is in at all. Jim Chrisley, who started all this research and has done all these drawings, a retired submariner, and uh, was funny, the first symposium we had in 2002, in all seriousness, he gets up there to Admiral Jay Cohen, who was haunting the project. He said, uh, so we're not sure where the sub went after it was cut loose. No, no, Jim, we're not. Well, I, I want to volunteer to do some research. What's that, Jim? She could have drifted, right? Yeah. If the Navy will pay for it, I'll check all the beaches in the Caribbean. So, that's about as far as that went. <laughs> the backers never get paid. The Navy never really accepts the boat. Now she's lost. And uh, I've never found any evidence that they, they got any of their money back whatsoever. They can't find Villawa. He disappears um, and will eventually die in, in 1875, a, a pauper old man. Our interest in submarines goes away after this. The only, there's one here that's close to finish, a fairly modern looking sub, which is Saligo. It was being built in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and was about two thirds of the way done. It's actually the first sub to use a periscope. Periscopes were known at the time that they're used by riverine surface ships, so commanders and officers can check for snipers before they go up top. Otherwise, you stay down below where it's safe. Uh, that, we pull the plug on that. The only one that survives intact is the Intelligent Whale, which oddly enough is in Seagirt, New Jersey, at a New Jersey National Guard Army base. But to give you an idea of, of what a dope slap all this research has been, not just for me, but for all the researchers, here's an intact submarine. Everything inside is intact, but there's no owner's manual. I've read an excellent dissertation by a fellow who wrote it years ago, and it's yay thick, and he goes through all the different systems, and we still don't know, know exactly how it works. At one point, one of the admirals on the project called me up and said, well, we're, we want to figure out how it works. What are we going to do? Well, our idea is we're going to take it to test facilities, we're going to put on rebreathers, and we're going to flood it and take it down. And then we're going to stay there, we figure out how to get it up. I said, cool. Then I told my wife. <laughs> All the guys told their wives. So it's still in Seagirt, New Jersey, but it made sense to me. We can't figure out how to get the dang thing to work, and it's intact. There are two enduring mysteries around alligator. The first one can only be proven by finding the boat. And that's the way it finally looked. Eakins makes reference to a second mode of attack. And it's interesting because his second mode of attack is pretty much drawn by an unknown Navy officer uh, on the blockade off Mobile in 1865. 
This has been done before. Again, we started researching this 15 years ago. We thought, oh, this is all unique stuff. Then we start realizing other countries have been doing the same sort of thing. When you look at this drawing, it's not a man exiting the sub. For one, if you exit the top hatch, you flood the sub. You notice it's a dashed line. The artist is somehow delineating the suit, but showing you it's part of the sub. Also, every kid since 1828, when these came out, knows how to draw a deep sea diver. It always has a separate helmet. It's not part of the suit. This is cloth, this is metal, brass, or something like that. Also, what's with the funny position for the arms? To me, he's showing the arms are flexible. He's got a chamber up here for a torpedo with insulated wire, which is perfect, which is exactly what I think Eakins is trying to do here. This is my reconstruction of how alligator might have looked in the end. Again, we can't tell. The reason why I theorize this is Eakins was asked by an admiral who was not in the need to know loop, how are you going to make the attack? And Eakins basically says, I'm not leaving the boat because he's too big to get out the chin hatch, but I will prosecute the attack myself. I don't want somebody else doing it because he's sitting there doing this, you know, hoping the diver actually sinks the enemy ship, but it's his career on the line. And he, then he says to the admiral, you don't need to know. So the admiral tosses him out of the Navy for two weeks until his civilian friends say, I'm not, you know, I don't have to keep my mouth shut like Eakins does. Let me explain what he wants to do. And this is pretty much what he describes as the second mode of attack. This makes it a much more lethal weapon because instead of parking it on the bottom and deploying a diver who has to get a mine, even if it floats, up to the target, now he can come up under that chain in Charleston. He's in direct communication with his crew like he's inside a tank. He can say, I see it 15 feet ahead of us. We have to come up a little, drop a couple pounds of ballast, go a little faster, back up a little bit, hook a grappling hook on, and start backing off to pay out the electric wire. It's a much more lethal weapon if this is the way the thing looks. This is a lot more intriguing. I put this in the book simply because I could not figure out why Villawa was willing to be tossed off his own project. Remember I mentioned the silver plates for making a spark and how much Villawa wanted? $2,000 worth of thick silver plates, a dozen or 16 of things. I went to a couple science professors at a local college up in Massachusetts and sort of said, what else can you do with this stuff? And they thought about it for a while, did a little research, and they said, you know, at a primitive level, this could be used to do what NASA does on the space station which is generate air. There's no way Villawa has enough silver or energy to feed the whole crew the oxygen it will need. But at a very primitive level, is this what he was trying to do? Remember we mentioned the chemical liquor there. I refer to it as bucket and bellows. Um, we thought Villawa was the first one to do this. Basically just take down a bucket of lime, spritz water on it, it sucks up the CO2. Turns out farmers, if not von Drabel, knew how to do this Back in the early 1800s, I found a number of almanac entries. If you've dug a well you need to make deeper, you don't want to just jump down there because it could be filled with CO2. So you lower a bucket with lime in it, and when it hits the bottom, you sprinkle water down. That sucks up the CO2. You bring it up and lower a candle in a bucket. If it gutters out, there's more CO2. You do this until the candle stays lit. This is what we think Von Drabel was doing, and everyone else since then was taking this bucket and bellows approach. They also had compressed air at this point in time. And we know Villawa had some aboard his fish boat plus the bucket and bellows approach. This gets to be so commonplace they don't delineate it. It's like go forward 200 years from now and find a description from today about how to tie your shoes. Everyone does it, everyone knows, no one's going to detail it. No one talks about this sort of thing, you just get oblique references. Here's the entire compressed air chamber, uh, Payern, Submarine, Auguste, the entire stern of the thing is full of air, plus he has a bucket and bellows approach. He also has the luxury of not having to go anywhere. His job of clearing Cherbourg Harbor of rocks allows him to anchor the boat a couple feet off the ground, open the hatch because the air pressure keeps the water out. The flowing current will actually cleanse the air. When it still got stale, they would spritz lime on water and freshen the air up. Villawa may have had or attempted an air generator. This isn't as far-fetched as it sounds, although his approach is unique because a few years later, Ictinio is a submarine that was theorized and built and demonstrated successfully by a fellow named Montour, Narcisse Montreal over in Barcelona, Spain. Um, he had a chemical reaction engine that provided enough heat to actually boil water to make steam. And the byproduct, the waste product of the chemical reaction was oxygen. At one point he goes to do a, a duration dive and a crowd gathers to watch him, you know, and they don't know if, Montreal, if he's going to come back up, you know, or be hauled up, how long is he going to be down there. And he's down there for hours. The day gets hot, the crowd gets thinner. Finally, towards evening, there's one reporter there who's going to see this story through come hell or high water, and he sees bubbles, and he sees Actinio's hatch, and the hatch breaks the surface, and they open it up, and there's Narcisse. And he looks down and he goes, are you okay? Narcisse goes, see, why'd you come up? We were bored. 
as long as he has chemicals, which unfortunately were terribly expensive, his engine works and he's making oxygen. So these guys are already thinking, if I can't replenish it, if I can't bring enough with me, can I make more while I'm down there? So it seems terribly advanced. It's not by their standards. Now, judging by the number of people who already started asking questions before this began, we're going to open it up for Q&A now. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.